Welcome to Best Practice Lubricant Storage and Handling Part 1. I'm Jared Pottinger, Education Services Manager for Deskcase. In Part 1 of this two-part series, we're going to talk about the importance of good lubricant storage and handling practices. We'll talk about receiving lubricants and dispensing lubricants. In Part 2, we'll talk about applying lubricants to machines and managing the condition of lubricants in service. Lubricant storage and handling is a critical component of precision lubrication. But before we get into that, let's talk about what precision lubrication really is, and to some extent what it isn't. For example, using better lubricants does not equal better lubrication. Lubricant quality and lubricant performance is an important part of a precision lubrication program, but it's certainly not everything. If you take the average machine and the average plant and replace the average lubricant with the best lubricant you can get, in most cases you won't really see any significant improvement. We have to do a lot of other things correct before we can actually realize the value of using a high performance lubricant in the average situation. Likewise, doing more lubrication is also not better and it's certainly not precise. Lubricating machines more often than is necessary is a waste of resources and in some cases it can even cause harm. Consider the effects of over-greasing an electric motor bearing. Precision lubrication really requires that we do a lot of things right. It requires a holistic approach. This begins with selecting the correct lubricant for each application. It requires education. It requires that we educate all of our maintenance professionals that are involved with lubricated equipment so that they understand not only how to do precision lubrication, but they understand the implications of doing good lubrication and of doing bad lubrication, what that ultimately leads to. It requires good contamination control on in-service oils. It requires optim an optimized PM program so that we're doing only the necessary activities and we're doing them at the most appropriate frequency. And it requires good storage and handling and finally it requires a good oil analysis program so that we can verify that all of those other things we're doing are being effective. Today we're going to focus on storage and handling. Now one of the good things, one of the side benefits if you will, of implementing precision lubrication is that a lot of the things that we would recommend that are different than the way people have traditionally done them are not only better, it doesn't only lead to cleaner oil, it's also easier it's more efficient, it's safer, and usually there's a time savings involved. But again, that's just a secondary benefit, but in a lot of cases, that's a good enough reason all by itself. If we want to understand why precision lubrication is so important, or specifically, why storage and handling of lubricants is so important, we have to consider what causes machines to fail in the first place. Well, according to MIT, about 15% of the time machines fail or lose usefulness because they become obsolete. We simply replace them with something better. Another 15% of the time machines break. We break them through accidents either with operations or maintenance. But the vast majority of the time, about 70% of the time, machines fail because of surface degradation. Now another way of saying surface degradation is where Okay, machines fail because they wear out. Well, that's really something we all knew already, right? But sometimes it's helpful to actually see it in terms of a study like this. So if we look a little bit further, you know, we could consider what causes machines to wear. Well, in a study from the STLE and the National Research Council of Canada, we find that 66% and 66% of wear-related machine failures, the predominant type of wear is abrasion. 12% due to adhesion, 8% due to erosion, and 8% due to fatigue wear or contact fatigue. Adhesion, if we leave the big one out there for a second, if we look at adhesion, this is typically caused when we have a lubricant that doesn't have enough film strength. So, it, so this is certainly a lubrication-related issue, but it's mostly based on lubricant selection. But if we look at those other three big ones, abrasion, erosion, and fatigue, we find that those are largely caused by one thing, and that is particle contamination in the oil, which is made worse by moisture contamination 
in the oil because it thins the oil film making particle contamination even more damaging so most machines fail because they're worn out most wear is caused by lubricant contamination so what we're saying is most machine wear and thereby most lost machine life could be avoided if we did a better job of keeping particles and moisture out of the oil so let's look at why we have particles in the oil in the first place if you consider the chain of custody of a lubricating oil from the time it's manufactured until the time you put it into a machine first it's created it's blended at a blend plant from there it goes into a truck which we may or may not be clean from there it might go to a secondary distribution site and eventually it's going to arrive at your distributor where it goes into a bulk tank potentially then it may be transferred into a 55 gallon drum or a 5 gallon pail or it may be put onto a smaller truck and delivered to your facility so there's a lot of steps in that chain of custody and most of those represent opportunities to contaminate the oil so oftentimes most of the time when we receive new lubricating oil it's already heavily contaminated with particles hopefully not moisture but from there when we receive it in the average plant it gets contaminated even more when we dispense it through a drum pump maybe we put it into an open top oil can or transfer container and then we pour it through a funnel and then it goes into the machine where we have an open vent on the machine that's continuously breathing and pulling in moisture and particles from the environment so there's a lot of opportunities for oil to become contaminated and it's in most cases it just gets more contaminated through its life cycle so we need to start looking at the first step where we the end user are in control of the cleanliness of that lubricant and that starts when we receive it so if you consider the average cleanliness I'm not sure what the average cleanliness of new oil would be but if you look at the particle counts on the screen here those are random samples taken from bulk oil and from drums and as you can see with just one or two exceptions most of those cleanliness levels are far dirtier than any type of target we would set for in-service cleanliness with our machines so the point is when we receive the oil it's going to be contaminated and that's not to lay blame on the lubricant supplier there's a lot of good reasons for this but what we need to realize is that it's going to be contaminated when we get it and we need to take steps to ensure it's clean before it goes into the machines so we need to think about how we receive the oil we need to think about how we store it, how we dispense it, how we transfer it to the machine, how we apply it to the machine, and then how we manage the condition of that oil while it's in service. And then ultimately, how we measure that with oil analysis. Now today, we're going to focus on those first two steps. We're going to look at receiving oil, storing oil, and then how we finally dispense it. Now when we receive oil, there are several things that we need to do several things we need to consider when it comes to receiving new lubricants if it's a bulk delivery if we're getting bulk oil in a truck it's going into the tank it would be a good idea to sample all bulk deliveries there's always the potential for new lubricant deliveries to be contaminated but with bulk oil there is more potential uh, most most uh, bobtail trucks that deliver bulk lubricants are also used to deliver fuel to deliver coolant and other chemicals so unless steps are taken there are a lot of opportunities for gross contamination so it's a good idea to take a sample of every new bulk oil delivery and immediately send that to the lab to verify that it's within acceptable standards it would also be a good idea to sample a number maybe not all but certainly a, uh, a random sample a statistically appropriate number of packaged lubricants as well just to make sure that all of the lubricants we're using are on spec and they're within reasonable parameters on contamination especially when it comes to moisture we need to establish reasonable limits for quality again considering that most new oil is going to be heavily contaminated with particles we could still set reasonable limits and we can work with our lubricant supplier to determine what those should be and finally we need to create a receiving procedure that not only accounts for sampling of new lubricants but basically one that makes sure that all of the delivery 
procedures are followed, such as flushing hoses between products or, you know, wiping fittings or, you know, the various other steps that we might want to include in a receiving procedure. We want to make sure that we have somebody there to ensure that all of those steps are followed. When it comes to storing and dispensing lubricants, there are a lot of different ways to do it right. There's no one right way. What we need to do is keep the ultimate goal in mind. The ultimate goal is that we get clean new oil into the machine, and of course we can keep it clean, and there's a lot of different ways to do this. But no matter what volume of lubricant you use, no matter if you get drums or bulk or whatever, we need to have these features in a storage and dispensing system. To, for starters, we need to have separate fluid handling for each product. So if we're using drum pumps or if we've got funnels or top-up containers, any type of tool we use to dispense, transfer, or apply oil should be dedicated to a particular type of oil. We never want to cross-contaminate different types of lubricants. Probably the single most important thing that we need to do is have some type of filtration. Even if it's just a spin-on filter on a drum pump, that's not ideal, but it's way better than nothing. So we need to have some type of filtration for each product. We also need to have good quality breathers on all the tanks that remove particles and remove moisture from the air that enters the sump. Every time you take 10 gallons of oil out of the tank, you pull 10 gallons of air in. In addition to thermal contraction and expansion, as the temperature changes throughout the day. We're actually pulling a lot of air into a storage tank, so we need to make sure we filter and dehumidify that air as it comes in, and desiccant breathers are a great way to do that. We need to have some type of good identification system that says which oil goes with which tank, goes with which spigot, which top-up container, which funnel, which lube point, etc. Everything that touches a particular type of oil should have some type of stamp or sticker or label or tag that says this is the type of oil that is used with this particular piece of equipment. It may not be essential, but it is an excellent practice to have climate control in the lubricant storage area. If not air conditioning in the summer for uh, humidity control and other reasons, it is important to have heat in the winter so that stored lubricants don't get very cold. When lubricants are allowed to get very cold in storage, there is increased risk for additive loss. So climate control is not critical, but it is definitely something we'd like to see in a good lubricant storage and dispensing system. Finally, we need good quality assurance procedures, not only for how we receive the oil, but how we store it, how we transfer it internally how we dispense it. We need to document all of those things so that we can use that documentation to train individuals within our group and also so we can maintain that program going forward. It's not enough just to take a handful of people and teach them the proper procedures for handling oil. We need to document these things so that when we have personnel changes and management changes and all sorts of changes going forward, that we can maintain the quality of that program going forward. When it comes to filtering new oil, there are good reasons to filter it at every stage of handling. Ideally, we would like to be able to filter the oil as we transfer it to our storage systems. Or if we're dispensing directly from drums, it would be a good idea to filter the oil in place before it's actually dispensed. So if we're transferring oil to a tank, we want to be able to filter it as it comes in. We would also like to have the ability to filter that oil while it's in storage. Oil can become contaminated in storage for a number of different reasons. So even if we don't need to filter the oil in place all the time, it's an excellent idea to have the ability to do that when we need to. And then finally, we need to be able to filter the oil as it's dispensed directly to the machine or to a top-up container or whatever it might be. Now, it's not essential to filter the oil at all three of these steps. Any one of these would be sufficient under certain circumstances, but if we want to have the best chance of success, we should have the ability to do all three. So we can filter it when we receive it, we can, we can filter it by recirculating it in storage, 
and we can filter it as it's dispensed. And this can take on a number of different forms depending upon the type of systems that we have. If you consider a bulk tank, like a 10,000 gallon bulk tank like the one showed in the picture here, typically in the average plant a tank like that is probably going to have a significant layer of dirt in the bottom of it. In the very bottom of this tank there's probably an inch or two of solid particles. Above that there's probably an inch or so of water and on top of that there's probably a good layer of algae until we get to the oil. So certainly this is something we need to correct. The thing that is is good about the situation is it is very easy to correct it. Usually the step from average, which is in most cases a very poor storage condition, to go from average conditions to world-class conditions is usually not a big step. You know, in this case, we have a bulk tank with a, a vent, uh, vent breather that's designed to stop rain from getting in. We have a pump and some piping. Very poor conditions for lubricant storage. But if we simply take that system and add a filter after the pump, and we replace that breather with a good quality breather that removes particles and moisture from the air coming in, we've transformed that from a very bad situation into a world-class storage and dispensing system. Now we can filter the oil when it's received, we can recirculate that oil and filter it ongoing, and we can filter it as it's dispensed. So taking whatever system you use today and transforming it into something that is world-class is usually not a big step. If you consider tote tanks, a lot of people use totes, 330 or 550 gallon totes, to transfer large volumes of oil around the plant. It's very convenient for transferring hydraulic oil or turbine oil when you need you know, hundreds of gallons, potentially. The average tote tank gets reused over and over and over, and over time is going to get very dirty. So usually the oil that's in a tote is going to be even dirtier than new bulk oil or new oil in a drum. So it's not a good condition from a contamination control standpoint. But if we simply take our filter card, if we put a couple of quick connect fittings on that tote tank and a high quality breather, we transform that once again from a very poor condition to a world class dispensing and transfer system. So two quick connect fittings, a desiccant breather and a portable filtration unit will turn that very dirty tote into a world-class dispensing station. And we can do the exact same thing with drums. If you take your average 55 gallon drum of oil, it's going to be very dirty when you get it. For most people, as soon as they start taking oil out of it, it's going to get even dirtier still. But if we use a couple of quick connect fittings, a desiccant breather, and a small portable filtration unit, again we've turned that dirty 55 gallon drum into a first-rate dispensing and transfer system. So we can hook up our filter and circulate that oil while it's in the drum and get it really clean and we can filter it directly into our transfer container. Now again that's not the only way to do it. Sometimes people like to take drums and put them in a horizontal rack and simply put a tap on it so that they can you know, gravity feed their top-up containers and that's fine too assuming we filter the oil before it goes into the rack. So if you go in a typical plant where they've got 55 gallon drums on a horizontal rack like this, that oil is going to be very, very dirty. But if you simply took your filter cart before you put the drum in the rack, take your filter cart, hook it up, filter the oil in place for 30 to 45 or, or maybe even 60 minutes, get that oil clean, then put a desiccant breather, and a good lubricant identification tag on it, then put it in the rack. Now again you've gone from a very bad condition to a world-class condition. So there's a lot of different ways to dispense lubricants. There may be you know, some custom solution that works best for you. These are just some of the ways that you can transform what is in effect a very poor storage and dispensing system into one that is truly world-class. Stay tuned for part two of our program where we're going to talk about application and the condition management of in-service lubricants. This has been part one of Best Practice Storage and Handling. I'm Jared Pottinger, Education Services Manager for Deskcase.